Hi, I'm Daryl Urbanski, and welcome to the Best Business Podcast. My mission is to help create 200 new multimillionaire business owners. How? You'll do better when you know better. In my interviews, you'll hear from self-made millionaires, seven-figure business owners, authors, and world-class experts sharing how they did it so you can too without experiencing the same obstacles they did. Now, if you like this interview, please share it with a friend you think will benefit. They'll appreciate it, and I will as well. You can also connect with me on social media. Look for Daryl Urbanski, D-A-R-Y-L, Urban Ski, U-R-B-A-N-S-K-I, and add me so we can be friends. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy what I've prepared for you right here, right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. And today we're joined by a very special guest, Chelsea Frederick. And Chelsea is the Vice President of Marketing at Brian Tracy. And if you don't know Brian, he's a wonderful old soul. A guru and highly paid plus sought out expert as a sales and business growth expert. Chelsea's been with Brian for going on 10 years now and they've actually expanded and now Brian is one of their clients. And I've asked her to come and speak with us today because she's a bit of an unsung soldier. She's a marketer who spends so much time doing she's not very well known in the expert world which to me is hilarious because I'm in, I'm in a mastermind with her and out of all the conferences I've been to and all the mastermind I've done, I really feel like deep, deep behind those blue eyes is a vast ocean of experience and wisdom. Chelsea can really hold her own and regardless of if it's a promotion to sell Brian stuff or a fundraiser or if she's in a friendly competition against other marketers as affiliates for one of uh, their JV partner launches, Chelsea's work is constantly crushing it and in the top, top, top percentile to the point that it's made some of my clients jealous to the point where I hear them say stuff like, how do they do that over and over and over? So Chelsea's a San Diego native. Um, and she's just a good friend and a wonderful marketer. Chelsea, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm great, Daryl. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course. No, it's an, it's an honor. It's a pleasure. And you've got a ton of value to share. We were talking about that before the call. And uh, I made the joke that yeah, as a marketer, you're the hot girl that doesn't know she's hot because you just, you get it so well. We've been in masterminds where everyone else has been lost and you're right there kind of following along. And again, it's the, the numbers you hit, the things you guys do. Um, it's just phenomenal. You really are, really are a well-versed marketer. So how did you even get into marketing, though? Like, I've known you for a while now, but I don't even really know your background story. So how did you even get into this? Yeah, that's actually a funny story. And, and thank you so much for that introduction, Daryl. I, re- I really appreciate it. And like Daryl said, in the masterminds, I'm going to kind of go off and lose people a little bit. And uh, But Daryl's right there with me, so I always appreciate your input. <laughs> Um, as far as getting started, I actually, you know, like Carol said, I've been, you know, like you said, I've been there for 10 years and, um, I majored in marketing in college and basically started at Brian Tracy right after the fact, um, knew Brian's partner from working with him in a previous business and, you know, I kind of walked in and resume in hand, didn't know if I was going to meet with Brian or not and, you know, was ready to train. It was okay, get behind the desk, and this is how we do things. Got it. So, um, yeah, I, I just always was interested in marketing. I went into Brian's, you know, business uh, not really, you know, knowing much about the expert industry or the guru industry at all and, and just started learning. You know, mm. when I started, I didn't know what a joint venture was. Right. And it's that's funny to me because now I've been in that space for so long and done so many joint venture deals and affiliate launches, um, you know, just kind of learning by trade. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, you guys are so well at what you do. Um, and again, I remember you guys were like one of the top one of the top five affiliates for selling a three thousand dollar product, and that's yeah, it's just it's so impressive. So, um, so now, what you've always been interested in marketing, you said. So, even like, is what what made you decide to take marketing in college? Um, I think just the whole aspect of the the psychology behind it. I mean, really, the customer and I actually took an online marketing course that I was pretty interested in in college, and uh, I was terrible at coding. But, you know, the psychological aspect and the writing aspect I really liked. Um, You know, and I've kind of transitioned more into the analytical side and just looking at the bigger picture and outsourcing the writing. So, and it turns out I like that better. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I like outsourcing too. (laughs) So, 
One, like in your time working then with Brian and figuring out how to market and not just market because you and I, we come from a world of direct response, which for those Mm -hmm. people listening, um, I feel like it's the only marketing world to be in. I mean, I think there's people who are into branding and building quote unquote awareness. And then there's people who are into direct response, which is I spend a hundred dollars. I made a thousand and knowing directly where that came from and being able to track it, um, to a very, like very, like to the decimal points. Um, whereas branding, it's more about getting quote unquote your name out there and it's spending a lot of money on putting your name out there and not really being able to figure out what is working or what isn't, what ad is performing, what isn't. So, and as you've gone exactly. along in your career, what have been some of the busy, biggest challenges for you in the world of direct response and online marketing and all this sort of stuff? Like what kind of, I mean, cause you, like you said, you're a perfect example. Cause you're someone that came in, you know, you did the formal education and you came in, you probably learned a lot of what you learned in school, um, didn't apply and had to learn more. And you've, you exactly. know, having come through the different tiers and hurdles, what were some of the biggest challenges and obstacles for you? Um, I mean, really, one of the bigger obstacles, and like you said, you know, direct response is so much about, okay, you take one action, and what's the result of that? You take another action, what is the result of that? Um, You know, attribution has been an ongoing challenge Mm. uh, for us, and, you know, really nailing down that dollar for dollar, Mm. uh, there's always always a, a question there, and I mean, I think particularly for Brian Tracy, we just have you know, we're, we're doing everything. So we have, we have evergreen email sequences that are two years long. And so there's a lot of different moving parts, mm-hmm. um, which adds to the level of sophistication on the attribution side and the challenge there. Right. Um, so that's, that's always been uh, more of an internal business challenge, but, but we've been able to, you know, get a good idea and, figure out if things overall have value. Sometimes you can't get it down to the exact decimal point, but if you can get close enough and know that you're making more than you're spending, sometimes that's good enough. Right, 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 right. Got it. So what kind of are the key kind of pillars of what you guys do then? Because you say you got everything going on. You guys have a blog, you do JV marketing, all that. I mean, what for you are some of the most powerful uh, revenue like generators or boosters? If you were to do something to try to grow revenues, what for you do you feel are some of the, what are the, what are the big things you need to focus on? Uh, for us, email marketing has been huge and just consistency and building that list and dev- and putting out content that has value and, you know, being consistent with it. Um, I think, I think adding value overall is, is the big thing, especially for Brian. He has so much content. We have so much to work with. He's always teaching. Mm. And like I said, we have evergreen email sequences that, that are just running. Um, so we've automated a lot of that and, you know, we also have affiliate marketing, we have outside ads, we have, we have the blog, like you said. So, you know, I think just the consistency and how long we've been running. Um, but, but for us generating quick revenue, it's mailing to our internal list for our own products. Right. right, Um, you know, that's always going to be the quick hit and you know, those are warm buyers. So. Yep. Now, what about for the people who are listening and they're like, when you talk about giving value and they're like concerned that, you know, well, how do I give value and not give away my product? Do you, do you, do you have anything to say to those people that may maybe voice that as a concern? Yeah. And I would say that, you know, put your best foot forward. You want to give good content and add value because that allows people to trust you. So, you know, lead with the best, capture that lead, and then you can div- dive in and figure out what else they want. You know, if they may not be interested in one product, but they could be interested in something else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's very true. And the, the one of the things that one of my mentors said that really helped drive that home for me is he said, Daryl, when you've got a music group and they have the chance to play one song on the radio that's going to be heard across the nation, they don't put out their second or third best song and leave their best song on the album you know, for the people who buy it to find that they take the best song they've got and they give it away for free 
uh, like for free across the radio across the country. They put like you just said their best foot forward. So, yeah, that's awesome. That's really awesome. What would you say to anyone who's kind of struggling in their business? Like, say someone's kind of having inconsistent sales, um, or say someone's got like a promotion they're trying to do and it's not. Like, what do you do when you've got a marketing campaign and it flops? How do you? How do you? Like, what would you do? So you guys prepared some sort of campaign. You put up your ads and stuff. You're sending people to site, but they're not buying. Now what? Okay, so we're talking specifically about the sales page and the offer. Got it. Yeah, look, look. No, it's good. It's good. You're being specific. Well, I don't know. I, I guess that's it. So is it the, it's the sales page and the offer, right? So we've got we're, – we're driving ads or emails or whatever we're doing. We're sending traffic to our buy page, so our sales page, and people aren't buying. So what would you do? Like, what do you do if and when that happens? I know that probably doesn't happen very often anymore, but <laughs> – yeah, no, it, it happens. It definitely happens. Um, I think the biggest thing you have to look at in that case, if you're getting traffic to the page and, and they're not converting, you know, look at the offer. Mm. How is that worded? Are you adding value? What's the price? Look at your competitors or if there's other products in that space. Mm. Um, you know, you, you got to start doing some testing at that point and try to figure it out. It could mm. be it could be one thing. I would also add things like um, click tail. Uh, right. or crazy egg to the yep. page and see, you know, how far people are scrolling, what they're clicking on, look at the numbers, you make sure you have the data and that can give you some insight into, into where you're losing people. Right, right, right. But would you shut everything off? Is that something like if you're spending, if you're running Facebook ads or something to drive the traffic to the page and people aren't buying, do you shut everything off and fix it? Like, or do you like, cause I, I, no, no, I think we, we'd keep running it. And, and and to be honest, we wouldn't go to Facebook and go to outside traffic sources until we had mailed our internal list first. Right. So, you know, go with your go with your warm leads first. And mm-hmm. then if it does well, then move to outside sources like affiliates and Facebook ads. Got it. Got it. Got it. No, that's great advice. Um, that's really great advice. So then so let's go kind of go back to this. So, all right, I'm starting up. I'm getting running. I got kind of a list. Uh, you know, I mail, maybe I got a list of a thousand or a couple thousand people, which for anyone listening, if that sounds really hard, uh, it's not hard at all. It's just exactly, if you, follow, if you follow Chelsea's steps, you're giving away content, you've got a specific avatar that you're dealing with, you know, you can ge- generate an audience pretty quickly of, of a few hundred to a few thousand people just with, like she said, consistency, dedication, and just really trying to know your people. Um, <clears throat> but what do you do if you don't have a list of like hundreds of thousands of people to mail and get swarms of traffic? So you, you mail a couple thousand, I'm not trying to put you on the spot and test you, but I know, I know that, like I said, there's a, a ocean of wisdom behind those eyes. So, you know, I've mailed my list of a thousand people. Do I keep mailing them and sending them back to the same page or how do I like, you know what I mean? Like I made a page, I'm trying to sell something for a hundred bucks or whatever it is. And I mailed my list of a thousand people. I got a bunch of people there and no sales. Do I mail them again? Do I get an ad and no. some traffic? What do I do? Yeah, I, I mean, if you mailed your own people that came in and they're not buying, I wouldn't I wouldn't mail them again. Um, you know, obviously, once they go through a sequence and they've seen that offer multiple times, that's when you don't mail them again. But you should never be sending one email and expecting a result. People need to be followed up with. Right. Um, Ooh, good, good, good. So keep, keep going. But, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's okay. Facebook, Facebook ads are great. You can get some cheap clicks that way, but... You know, there's a lot of interest on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, you just have to do a lot of testing to find the right market. So I would immediately target competitors and people in the same niche, which are going to be the closest thing to your own warm leads, mm-hmm. um, yep. and get those people to the page. But at the same time, if you're putting traffic on that page, you should be testing something from the very beginning, you know, whether it's price or, you know, button text, have those tools and analytics in place before you even start so you can determine winners and move forward and run more tests throughout, especially starting out with a new offer. Right, right, right. So now if someone's listening to this and they're not in the online marketing world, and I want to put a caveat here or, or I don't yeah, I just want to mention that although we're talking in terms of online, it's the exact same if you put an ad in a newspaper and you're sending people to call like a phone number versus you're putting an ad on Facebook and you're asking people to go to your website and then your phone number's there and they're going to call you. Like whatever that method is, it's it's the same stuff. The mediums, the channels might be different, but marketing is marketing and the principles still apply. 
So for those of you that are talking about, they're talking about testing, huh? What like what is this going on? So exactly what Chelsea said, we want to make sure that we're always testing a couple of different variations of whatever it is. If you're doing direct mail, you want to be testing two different letter letters. You want if you're doing a sales page, you want to be testing two different versions, right? And why why is that so important, Chelsea? Like, what, can you maybe speak to some of the results that you guys have had and why why testing is something that everybody talks about but not really as many people do? Why has it been beneficial for you guys? Um, well, really, it allows you to learn about your offer and your customer base. Like every test should have a goal of not only determining a winner and a loser, but what the learning is out of that. It's okay to have losing tests, but um, if you can really determine more about your customer and be able to tailor the message and the marketing toward them, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in a clearer way, then then you're going to have better results, hands down. Right. So, you know, some examples that we've had is is opt-in pages are an easy, are an easy fast thing that you can test. You know, a headline, that, that's the simplest thing that you can test on an opt-in page. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've been able to boost an opt-in page that we've had for one of our bigger offers from 20% to 35%, and that's been pretty consistent throughout just by – just by testing multiple headlines. So right. which is huge. So without changing yeah. without changing your ads, without changing the vault like your ad, your marketing budget, or even what you're selling, just by testing a different headline, you were able to take it from what was it, twenty three percent to thirty five? Yeah, right around twenty percent to thirty five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Depending that, on the traffic source. And that's huge. That's almost a 50% bump on, on yeah, revenue exactly. because all the other numbers stay the same, right? So, yeah, that's that's awesome. So, And the reason why I wanted you to say that is because I just it's been relevant for me where I've had clients that they're testing stuff and they're afraid of spending money because – one thing I think people need to understand is your marketing is never going to be as inefficient as when you first get it up and running because you've got no tests. You've got no data. You went with mm-hmm. your gut. You threw it out there, and you're hoping that you and a small group of three, four, five people can accurately predict the wants, needs, and desires of hundreds of thousands of people. You know, And even if you're not getting hundreds of thousands of people to your site, they represent a percent that's – you know what I mean? Like they represent exactly. some tribe, some group of people in that – in that universe that you're marketing to. So no, that's huge wisdom. That's huge wisdom. What else you got for us, Chelsea? I mean, what else has been kind of a big aha for you in your marketing career or something that, um, cause you work with a lot of people and that's the other thing. You can really tell someone's an expert when they are able to judge someone and their abilities and skills and not, I don't mean that in a bad way, but if someone's been brought on your team or if you have a client that wants to onboard someone and you can just look and tell, or just spend some time, like an hour with that person and already be able to predict, that's really a sign of, of prowess and expertise. So when you have people that you try to work with in marketing or you're working with another JV partner and stuff. What are some of the biggest kind of mistakes you see other people making, if that makes sense? Either when you try to work with them as a JV partner and you like you go to mail their funnel and, you know, something's wrong in their marketing promotion or you're just trying to bring someone on board to work for you. What are kind of the biggest, uh, yeah, just the biggest things that people are lacking or mistakes they're making? Um, well, we actually don't see too much, too many mistakes on the JV side anymore just because we've chosen to really only work with a, a select few who have proven results. Um, you know, we can't, we can't spend the time teaching people what they should be doing, but we need to, especially mailing other offers. We're looking for, you Mm -hmm. know, that proven trail of success. Um, but I I think definitely some of the biggest mistakes are, you know, starting off directly mailing to the sales page and not capturing the lead first. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, not, not building that funnel and, and thinking about the thought process throughout, um, you know, marketing isn't just a, a one-off and you're done. It's really a sequence of events. And like I said before, you have to follow up with people. So I, I think the biggest thing is um, really getting people into your world, into your arena so that you can follow up with them and also optimizing the opt-in page. If you can increase your lead base from the front end, it increases everything on the back end. So, you know, when we're talking about sales pages that don't work, you have to get that sales page working or else it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But from there, the biggest thing to focus on is the opt-in page because that just increases everything else through the funnel. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. 
I, um, I wholeheartedly agree. And for anyone who's listening, an opt-in page is exactly what she said, a lead capture page. And the back end, uh, well, the back end is all your back end offers and promotions. So uh, what we're talking about is that any business, there's kind of different tribes. There's the unknown universe, there's people you don't know and they don't know you. And then there's kind of the semi-known universe where there's people who know of you, but you have no idea who they are. And so many businesses make this mistake. I mean, I go to restaurants all the time where I go in and I drop 30, 50, 80, 100 bucks and I leave and they have no idea what my name is, where I'm from. Like they don't even know my zip code. So if they're going to mail it a flyer, they're not going to mail it the flyer to people who actually know, like, trust them and have given the money. They're going to pick some random area and mail it, you know, and there's no relationship. So we come from a world where you want to try to take that unknown universe and, and from an unknown to a semi-known to now a known where I know who they are and they know who I am and I have their contact info. So I can just, like Chelsea said, send them valuable information over over a period of time to establish myself as an expert. That way, when they do come to make a a purchase decision, you know, we've educated them so they know and trust us. And if what we're offering matches what they need, then the sale becomes really easy. There's no need for any hard sales. Is that kind of accurate, Chelsea? Or Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't have put it better, Daryl. Mm, good, good, good. That's awesome. So now what's some of the best advice that like, cause I know about myself, I keep quotes and stuff like that. And I just constant reminders and things that pop up and you have just really been exposed to some of the top, top brass as far as um, who's out there in the marketing world and what have been what's been some of the best advice that's you know the, for that you've gotten that's really helped you with your marketing in your career the best advice I've ever gotten mm-hmm. I mean I think starting out one of the best one of the best pieces of information that that I had and kind of one of the things I was lacking in is you know I kind of had that mentality of I, I can do it. I can do everything. We don't, you know, we don't need that much help. Obviously, on the tech side, it's a different area. But just really starting to outsource and really starting to build an internal team and, and share that knowledge, mm. uh, there's, there's no replacement for that. I mean, if you can free up your time and start working on your business instead of in it, yeah. that it's a game changer. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to kind of let go of, of some of the little things, but, uh, you know, on the day to day and just being so involved, but, um, it, it has a, an unforeseen benefit that, you know, you, you kind of don't see in that moment, but when right. it, when it, you actually get there, it's, it's, that's the best thing that you can do. Got it. So who are some of the key people on your team? We're talking about building a team. And if people are listening to this, they're like, well, what kind of a team do I need? I don't know. I've, Cause I mean, there's the standard names and roles, but I mean, what, who are the key people? If you had to start over fresh and build a new team, what would you, who would you want? What would their job titles be? Or what would be the, you know, if the job title described the work? Well, I think it kind of starts on, uh, starts with you and what you're doing and what are those repeatable tasks that you can get off your plate and who's going to be the best person to do that. So, you know, for us, email was a big thing. And at the time we were doing, uh, monthly special offers, which took up a lot of time. Um, obviously, putting an offer together, getting the page, getting the images, putting the email copy together, that takes a lot of time. So, you know, the first thing is offloading high-value tasks that are repeatable mm-hmm. um, so you can keep them going and kind of free up that space for yourself to work on other areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so, <clears throat> obviously, you know, marketing has evolved since since that happened, but, um, but I think that's where you start is one of those repeatable tasks that you can get off your plate. Um, really, you know, needing, having a writer at hand, having a designer at hand, having a, a tech person at hand, those are all, you know, specialist positions that, that you definitely need to have, um, resources for. But other than that, it's, you know, what, what have you been able to create and put into some kind of system that you can offload and, and have someone help you with? Mm, right. Systems, 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 systems. And a lot of systems, systems processes, <laughs> systems, processes, words to live by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And for, for a lot of people like who are, maybe aren't experienced, a lot of times it can be as simple as a checklist, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be yeah. some uber sophisticated thing. It just has to be a checklist that you could give a teenager and have them follow to get the same result. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Brian, Brian Tracy has a quote actually where he says, every minute you spend in planning saves 10 minutes in execution. And this gives you a thousand percent return on energy so if you can put that time into planning and putting that process on paper and then offload that i mean that's gold 
That is that is gold. Can you repeat that quote again? It was like it yeah. hit me like a wall when you said it. I was, <laughs> and then there was like a last sentence. I was like, "Wow, that's so great!" And, and in my head, I was like, "She's not done yet." Like, because there was more. You're because you were like a hundred percent, a thousand percent ROI. Can you just repeat it again? I just really want to yeah. soak in it. Uh, and he says, "Every minute you spend in planning saves ten minutes in execution. This gives you a thousand percent return on energy." Got it. That is awesome. Yeah, so well. Brian done. Tracy. Yeah, <laughs> Brian Tracy, eh? <laughs> yeah. What's it been like working with him for so long? I mean, he, I've I've seen him on stage three or four times, and he's always just always just a phenomenal character. Just such a, you just can get this feel about him. He's got like a warm fuzzy soul around him. Like he's just such a nice, soft spoken man, and just really articulate and just well spoken. Well, it's the same thing, but just I don't know. I just I've always enjoyed his presentations. He really hits you hard. So what's it been like to work with him? Uh, it's been great. I mean, we don't get to see him as much as we should. He's he's traveling the world speaking still at, at 71. So, right. uh, <laughs> but yeah, I can't believe he's still going. He's amazing. He has more energy than, than anyone. I definitely couldn't travel as much as he does, but it, it's been great. I mean, he's such a, you know, legend and full of so much wisdom, the amount of stories and just metaphors and things that he can refer to. It's, it's amazing to kind of watch his mind think. So mm. it's, it's been great. Mm. Now you said he's still going and I mean, he's 71 and he's had a phenomenal career. So it's not necessarily like he's hurting for money. So why do you think he still does it? He loves it. I mean, he loves writing books. He loves speaking. Like that's, that's really what he's focused on and what he's been focused on for the last 10 years that I've been there. You know, he's not necessarily so much into the online side. Um, you know, that's not the generation that he grew up in, but he continues to consistently put out four books a year and, you know, do over a hundred speaking engagements. So wow. he's just really a machine and, you know, you can tell that he was born to do this. I mean, I don't think anybody can argue with that. So. Mm. Well, no, I'm glad you said that because I think that that articulates something that's kind of been a common thread in this podcast. And that's talking about, you know, when you said like he just loves to do it and, you know, and he's just a machine. And I don't think you can be like that if you're doing something you don't enjoy, right? Exactly. I mean, I don't think exactly. I don't think you would be as interested in it. I mean, that was something even you said at the beginning that you were just naturally interested in marketing because of the psychology and it just seemed to fascinate you. And I don't think you would be as good as you are if you didn't have that sort of interest. And I know I've given clients lots more, not, you know, in some instances a lot more than they've paid for, but mostly because I was just so fascinated and intrigued by the project. So, um, I think that's an important uh important little tidbit for some of the listeners to think about. So, yeah, and I think you know, when you naturally have a curiosity in something, like you said, you've given more value in a lot of instances than you should have, but, you know, it's the, it's your curious mind just, you know, wanting to learn more and wanting to naturally, you know, give more. So mm-hmm. I think that that really drives um, those the people's passions. So what are some of the things that you really love about marketing now? I mean, you've, I know, I know, cause I've heard you come, you know, when we have our meeting, meetings and, you know, Oh, I'm doing this now. Now I'm the affiliate manager. Oh, now I'm writing emails. Now I'm doing this. What's kind of the part that you really love? If you could hand select the things that you would want to focus on, what are the things that you're kind of passionate about right now? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think overall, one of the things I love, especially on the online marketing side is, just the amount of new opportunity and new tools and new ways that people are uh, marketing these days, just remarketing in itself. Uh, That's a whole new area that's just, you know, a no brainer for companies today. Like why wouldn't you want to bring warm leads back to your offers? Mm. Um, You know, so I, I really follow the trends and, and, and love to get into, you know, the, the new technologies, Facebook ads. I've done a lot of Facebook ads, and I love it. But I also love creating a system and writing it down and then getting it off my plate so I can move on to something else. Right. I definitely don't think I could be doing, you know, the same thing forever. And, and I don't think anybody should in their own business. You know, you need to evolve with, with the new technologies and what's out there. And, you know, but I, I like to get an understanding of things to the point where I can manage it mm-hmm. and then build a system and get it off my plate. So, it. you know, right now I'm really looking at um, other retargeting angles and, and just building those systems. Um, we're doing, we have two people starting on Monday and we're doing uh, some serious hiring. So I, I'm really focusing on building those processes and, you know, fixing our systems and making things easier for 
my team to do their job. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I'm kind of on the same boat. I've got a girl that I'm hiring on Monday, and her sole goal is to help me create more SOP, standard operating procedures, for exactly that same reason that you mentioned. It's just such a critical That's thing. Awesome. Yeah, so, well, yeah, because, I mean, I mean, there's a couple of ways you can do it for anyone listening. I mean, you can have all your staff create a checklist of what they do in a day. And then pick the ones mm-hmm. that, that they do and, and try to get them to make a checklist of how they do everything. And that's an easy way to try and do it internally. Um, and for me, some of the stuff, I don't even necessarily know what the bottleneck is. So my goal is just hire this girl to kind of follow me and my team and just kind of document the things that we're doing and, and just make sure it's all organized and just own that role. <laughs> because I think it's such, like you said, it adds <clears throat> it adds a deeper value to your business as, to your business as an asset because now everything's documented and can be replicated. Um, and if you can't track it, you can't manage it. And if you can't manage it, you can't optimize or improve it. So, um, yep. yeah, so that's really, really, really important. Chelsea, what kind of habits do you think have led to your success as a marketer? Is there any kind of key things that you think that, you know, if you hadn't done those or weren't doing those on a consistent or regular basis, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, annually, what would they be? What are the ones that have contributed to helping you develop your marketing prowess and your ability to kind of drive revenue on demand? Uh, I think one of the biggest habits is continuous learning, and, and we have it on our culture board for in our office, um, you know, for everyone to see is continuous learning is, is a constant. I have, I have I, like I said, I love learning new technologies and new areas of marketing, and, um, you know, that's really allowed me to stay on top of things and not only get stuff off my plate, but, um, you know, move on to that next thing because I'm able to kind of identify what that thing is. Mm -hmm. So I think really carving out that time for yourself Mm -hmm. um, to do that and not getting stuck in a thousand emails and, you know, really stuck in the things that you have to do because there's always going to be things that you have to do. And I mean, don't get me wrong, it's been a struggle. I'm looking at my inbox right now and (laughs) there's way too many emails in there, you know, but... You know, you really can't allow other people to dictate your time. And sometimes you just have to shut that stuff down and really stop and think about what's important. So I really try to give myself, you know, one day a week or a half day, a morning or an afternoon to kind of take a step back and think about, you know, what I should be doing versus what I am doing. Um, And then also continuously, you know, reading in my field and, and staying on top of that. Mm, that's. I think that's huge. I know that um, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates were both interviewed separately, and they didn't know the other person was being interviewed at all. And they were both asked if they could have one superpower to help them in the business world, what would it be? And they both said it would be the ability to learn faster than anyone else. Because if oh, learn, yeah. Yeah, because if you could Definitely. learn faster, then you would always have the upper hand because you would always know the better way to do stuff. And I think you're right because it's kind of a – Kind of, you're either on one side of the line. Either you're not learning a lot enough or you might feel you're learning too much because you're learning all this stuff, but you're not getting it implemented. And I don't know what side mm-hmm. of the line is better to be on. I don't. What's your opinion on that? Is it good? Well, you know, you got to have a balance. You have to have both. Uh, if you're doing all learning and not implementing, then that just becomes an excuse to not take action. Mm. Um, but but you have to be doing both. Mm. Um, I don't think there, I don't think there is any way around it. And you just have to figure out how to decide, divide your time. Right, 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 right. No, I think that's, I think that's really, really well said. Um, so how do you really learn? Like what's, what are your learning methods? Someone's like this, they're like, all right, Chelsea, I'm on board. I'm all gung ho. I'm going to learn. I'm going to do what I need to take. What do they, what do they need to do? What are they, what, any books that they should read? Are there anything like what? help 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 our listeners out they're like i want to learn how to generate revenue on demand chelsea what what do i do what do i learn what do i what do i focus on well i think you know i think there's many avenues and and podcasts are making a huge comeback so i I kind of take every opportunity i can to learn while i'm while i'm cooking or cleaning listening to a podcast or you know in the car university on wheels as brain tracy calls it always listening to audio books or another podcast Mm -hmm. um but I think that, you know, I kind of, I follow certain people and there's always, they're always putting out more than I can consume. Like Digital Marketer is a, is a big one for me. I, I love what they put out. So, you know, it's very tactical information on the internet marketing side, but that is what makes me realize there's, there's just so much out there to be done um, on the online side. So I definitely follow Digital, Mar- Digital Marketer. Uh, Neil Patel is another favorite of mine. Mm-hmm. Um 
you know, as far as books, I think the the greats like Ogilvy on advertising and Breakthrough Advertising, Eugene Schwartz, those are both classics that every marketer should read. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my book list is longer than I can ever possibly get to, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> which is a little frustrating at times, but, you know. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's a good summary site out there that I should be following. I feel like I probably searched that once a month, but I, have, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> no, I know exactly what you mean. It's funny because uh, when I was living um, in San Diego, one place I was living, my landlord, he would always deliver the mail. And I remember he was like, he's like, you're not reading all these books, right? <laughs> And, and, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not. Cause I, you know, I get like a book a day or at least a couple a week, but, um, I think it was Jim Rohn who said the book you don't own, you can't read. And the book you don't read can't help you. So I always just, that's you know, a great quote. It, well, it's true because, and it's, it's, you know, there's been countless times there's a, been a book that's been sitting on my shelf. And I mean, with Amazon or, you know, some of the online sites you can get, I mean, I buy books for use for like a penny plus shipping. I mean, it's a no brainer. I mean, you know, I buy, yeah. I buy friends copies of think and grow rich for a penny plus shipping. And if you're a prime member, there's no shipping. Um, you know what I mean? It's like for a penny, I just sent my friend a book that's based on 20 years worth of, uh, study on the world's most successful men and women for a penny. Like, why would you not buy that? So you can have it on your shelf because when wow. you get that question, you can, yeah, I know you can just go grab it, open it. And even if you never read the book, you can just pull that one gem out of it. You need to get at least something out of that book. So no, I love it. Yeah, I, exactly. I love it. Wait, so are you not, are do you read all your books in hardback or paperback, but not digitally? Um, <clears throat> it's a bit of a mix. Um, I don't know what to say. Like when I'm mobile, I just, I like books. So I'm not a Kindle per, like screens, yeah. like screens or I just, I look at too many screens in a day. So I like to look at something that I can hold in my hand and, um, yes. Yeah, and especially what I like to do when I read, I actually, when I read, <clears throat> I like to read the table of contents first and then the back of the book, the summary. And then I try to like, just kind of flip through it, see if there's any area that I can, you know, skip because it doesn't seem to be relevant to me at that time. And then I read those parts. And when I read, I almost always read with a pen because then I underline the stuff that I think is good. Mm. So that way, if I ever come back to the book, I just read the stuff I underlined, like depending on what state, like if I'm just, you know, if I'm in the mode that I just want to scan and go through, I'll just read the gems. And then if I have more time, I can read, you know, the stuff between the lines, but you'd be surprised how many pages you can skip in a book when you just underline the gems and then when you get yeah. back, you can kind of do that again. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Like, <clears throat> I'm a book geek when I travel half the weight of my travel luggage is books and I like, I, oh, I, love, I know. I love falling asleep on my bed with all my books around me. I feel like, like I'm absorbing the information, like osmosis. <laughs> when I'm asleep. I've, I've fallen asleep hugging books before. I'm not even like, not one book. Oh like, my gosh. Books like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I remember you at TNC last year and, uh, I think I picked up your backpack and I was like, what the hell is in here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was unbelievable. <laughs> and actually the ones but... you mentioned were in there. David Og Ogilvy on advertising. <laughs> I remember and... that. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause you t started taking stuff out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i was short out see they are my children i was like this is my one book yeah. i haven't read it but i love it this is my <laughs> that's funny because i read a lot on my ipad but i i'm the same way i love books so i kind of want i want all versions i want the digital version i want the audio i want the real book right um but I end up reading on my iPad most often just because I can take it wherever I go. And I use the highlight aspect in there, actually. And then you can scan back through and look at your notes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think I think I think there might even be a way to export that to Evernote. That's what I'm hoping. But, uh, but yeah, I'm trying to figure that one out. Export what to Evernote? Like PDFs? Your note from... We'll export from uh, iBooks or your Kindle the highlighted stuff, and then you have, you know, an Evernote document that has all your book notes on it. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be huge. Yeah. Got so I'll, I'll make sure that I update you if I find it. I think I heard that that was available and was the same thing. Like, oh my gosh, that would be amazing. But that, that would be um, amazing. but I'll definitely let you know if I find if I find out how to do that. Cool. Yeah, please do. Please do. I'm always looking for it. And I like how you mentioned how it's multimedia as well. And I know for you, you're going to conferences and meeting. Something you mentioned is going to conferences in person, reading books, listening to books, <clears throat> sharing ideas with people, getting surrounded by people who are into the same stuff that you're into, who are trying to accomplish the same goals. I think that's all really important for anyone that's listening to this that's trying to evolve and grow themselves. You need to do that. You need to. There's three parts to success. There's skill set, mindset, and environment, what one of my mentors told me. And I think that's really, really 
really, it really, really rang true for me. You need the skills to achieve what you're out to achieve. You need the mindset that you can do it and the mindset to get away from people who are going to tell you that you can't. People are always going to try to impose their limits on you. Uh, that's a, that's a, in fact, a uh, buddy that I was training with at CrossFit, he was even saying that. I was like, dude, that's so much. And he's like, he's like, thank you, but I prefer if you don't try to limit. I was, I, I forget what he said, but it was like, thank you, but I prefer if you don't try to, to limit me to your restrictions or some, he said something like that. And I was like, Whoa, because he's because he, then he picked up the weight and he just kept going. You know what I mean? And I was like, I was like at my max. So there's a mindset component of it too, where you know we all want to stay kind of with the group, but sometimes if you're trying to lead the pack, you got to be able to like to pull out of that. And you know some of the ideas you might have or the opinions may not be popular. <clears throat> um, and you know some sometimes you have to take a risk. Like you know um, people tell you, you might work too much or whatever, but it, again, it just depends on goals, right? Uh, never take advice from someone on something you don't want to trade shoes with them for. So anyways, I'm just trying to recap on that, Chelsea, because you've given such good wisdom and really, really beautiful gems here. Just as an example, and that's even what I said at the beginning of the call, you are so deep into the doing that you're not really well known in the expert space, but you're because of that, because you're learning and implementing that, you're just, you just, you really know your stuff. So, um, couple of questions before we wrap up right now i guess we're for the rest of the year what kind of things for you and this is kind of a moment for you i guess what kind of things do you need to do in order for you to just really break through and smash all your goals for the rest of the year is there anything that's like you know what are the three things that you kind of need to finish in your head if you know if there are only three things that you could focus on for the rest of the year what would they be oh daryl coming up with the tough questions um <laughs> Three things? They can only say three things? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, you know, one, one of the things for me, and I, I know I've talked at, about it already, is, is really just the process part and the systemizing mm. um, of, our, of our business. We kind of just made a big shift, and um, I'm really trying to get out of the weeds mm. and take a, a bigger view um, and just really clearing my plate of the, the so many to do's that add up, like just looking at my list, it's, you know, little things that aren't adding a ton of value. Like those things, those things have to go. So I, I think the first thing is developing processes um, and systems internally. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing is um, clearing my, my to do list and, you know, offloading that to someone else on our team. That's why we're hiring. So we can start getting our own plates a little bit, um, a little bit clearer there. Mm-hmm. And I think number three is, um, launching a podcast <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's for, that's for Brian Tracy. And we have another client actually Phil town that we work with. So we're actually in the process of launching a podcast for both of them. And it's kind of been an ongoing project, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, in the next couple of months, we're really hoping to do that. Got it. Got it. Got it. Perfect. So yeah. And let's talk about that a little bit. So before you guys were, um, kind of working for Brian, but now you kind of flipped the script where now you guys are, are somewhat of an agency. It sounds like, and you're recruiting top tier talent. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, we are moving more towards the agency model, but we we're really partnering with talent essentially like, like Brian, Brian's, you know, been a, been awesome. Um, you know, he's really, uh, given us a lot over the years and yeah, we're starting to do the same thing that we've been able to do for Brian with other clients. So Phil town, he, he's a professional investor and the hedge fund manager. We're working with him. And then we also are working with Dr. Mike Marino, who is a best-selling author, New York Times best-selling author actually of the 17 day diet. Mm. So very yeah, cool. very, it's, very it's cool. interesting. The three different niches, you know, personal development and, sales and everything else that Brian teaches right. and then investing in money and then on the health side. So, And is there a different in the vertical for the people that are listening to this that think their business is different? Is there a big different in your strategy or your approach or the principles or how you're going to market and sell and try to drive revenue for these people? Uh, no, it's really the same strategies and principle, principles and, and core pillars, really. It's just the content that's different. And, you know, it's kind of the same thing we were talking about at the beginning, like, we're starting over in these niches. So it's really learning that customer and something that it's one of the strategies or tactics that may work for one client may not work for another, Mm -hmm. but you know, in general, the core principles are the same. 
Got it. Got it. Got it. So well said. So if you guys like, who's an ideal client for you? If anyone listens to this either may think they're likely, or if they potentially could refer someone to you, who would be an ideal client for you guys? Are you guys like full right now? Uh, we do slowly onboard clients. Um, we are pretty full right now, but like I said, we're hiring so that we can start taking on more. Um, we're really looking for kind of C-level celebrities, somebody that has a name in their space, can create content, has some kind of list, and really just needs a team to manage their day-to-day operations and their marketing. Got it. Got it. Got it. So how does anyone reach out to you if they're interested, if they were interested in finding out more information or just picking your brain? Um, what's your contact info? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn or you can email me at Chelsea at brandatize.com. That's B-R-A-N-D-E-T-I-Z-E. And, and you can go to brandatize.com and, you know, check us out and take a look at the team and, and what we've done. Got it. And on LinkedIn, it's Chelsea, C-H-E-L, wait, hold on, C-H-E-L-S-E-A, and the last name is Frederick, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K. And you said the company is yep. Brandeis? Branditize. Branditize. So, you know, it's basically on the, on the, um, idea of monetizing your brand. Uh, so it's B-R-A-N-D-E-T-I-Z-E. Got it. So if anyone wants to reach out, Chelsea at branditize.com, look for a LinkedIn or just check out the website branditize.com. Chelsea, thank you so much. Um, I think everyone who's been listening in can already tell <clears throat> that you've just you've just you dropped some big bombs on us today. Um, you've got so much information. So thank you so much for sharing. Of course, I value, cherish, and appreciate your friendship, your mentorship, your you being an advisor. So just thank you so much for sharing with my listeners today. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Daryl. I mean, you've been same great friend, mentor, partner, and. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you as, as a person. So thank you so much. That's awesome. You've reached the end of our interview. Now, first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, What can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. Uh, You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.